Welcome to Operating with Positive Impact, a brand new series of podcasts brought to you by PwC. My name is Anthony Nev, and throughout this series, I'll be your personal guide in shaping your organization into a sustainable business. Together, we will deep dive into the world of sustainability and its impact on the business world. Leaving fossil fuels. This is a sentence we hear more and more often, but With which energy source should we switch? What are the alternatives? And where to start a transition? In this episode, join Jan Kukarts and Philip Landers from the Energy Transition Team and discover how to take advantage of this energy transition. From solar panels to wind turbines passing by hydrogen, discover which alternatives can fit your organization. Jan and Philip will unpack the concept of energy transition towards a low carbon economy discussing essential technologies, renewable energy sources and innovations that are driving changes in the energy sector. Let's listen to Jan and Philip. Hello everyone and um, welcome to another episode of this podcast. My name is Jan Kukertz and today we're going to talk about the energy transition and t I have with me today uh, Philippe Landers. Philippe, maybe you want to introduce yourself as well? Sure. Hey, Jan. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so, Philippe Landers, I'm uh, uh, quite excited to be here uh, today. Um, I'm part of uh, the consulting practice as well. Um, I'm part of uh, a team that's called the Fit for Growth team, um, where we see ESG besides digital and innovation as key growth drivers of, uh, of our business. And I have a, a, an exciting second role, which is I'm the EUNR uh, team uh, driver, um, where uh, energy and uh, the energy transition uh, company uh, within EUNR, which stands for Energy Utilities and Resources uh, uh, Industry Sectors, um, where the energy transition is, uh, of course, a massive topic uh, for all of the clients in that portfolio. Today, about the energy transition it has uh, already been dropped a few times. Um, I think everyone uh, knows quite well what or qui quite a bit about the energy transition. Um, personally, it impacts me by, for example, the last months I've been uh, in the process of buying a house, uh, buying, renovating, a lot of decisions to take there. Uh, and uh, topics like a geothermal heat pump or a photovoltaic sonal solar panels or uh, very high insulation requirements are a lot different than the previous time when I bought a house, for example. So it's uh, it's yeah impacting my day to day uh, as well as anyone's, I think. Philippe, maybe. Yeah, it's it's quite excited. You quite exciting. You mentioned that, Jan, uh, because I uh, built a new house uh, that was finished around 18 months ago, and we really took like energy neutrality as one of the design requirements from the start. And that included not only all of the aspects that you uh, just mentioned, but also like an integrated energy management system that uh, helps me with, you know, turning things on and off and suggesting when to consume uh, as more uh, renewable energy is available uh, uh, in, uh, in my particular house. So, yeah, quite... Uh, That, that speaks to me. Also have uh, some personal uh, uh, stakes, let's say, in this energy transition and it, it, it makes it very tangible. Yeah, and I think uh, regulations uh, in Belgium, for example, have become very, very strict in uh, yeah, when building a new house. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, as I mentioned, it's a, a huge difference compared to the previous time. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Philippe, uh, how come you have invested in becoming an expert in the field of energy? Well, on the one hand, there's lots of challenges at our clients in both uh, energy intensive uh, sectors, uh, but also in uh, less energy intensive sectors where um, they are looking for advice on how to navigate this landscape. They're looking for advice on, you know, the... Um, on the legal side, on the uh, incentive side, but also on the operational side, engineering side, and then last but not least, on the economical business side, on how to make sure that whatever decisions they take now are actually non-regret moves, and ideally, how are we going to help them benefit from uh, this energy transition? And, and naturally, 
one of the big catalysts with regards to these questions coming to, to me and my teams was the energy crisis uh, that we had uh, recently. And so uh, with price levels uh, more back to normal, I would say, today, um, uh, but volatility not entirely uh, out of sight yet. So we are uh, still expecting volatility to remain. And I think uh, there's lots of uh, big consumers, especially in energy intensive uh, industries indeed, that are still fundamentally considering um, big uh, questions around their footprint, around their production capacity in light of the relative uh, non-independence of energy uh, on the European mainland. Uh, mm. We don't have uh, ample supplies of uh, molecules. We don't have uh, uh, an, an amazing array of uh, solar available to us all year round or amazing arrays of wind or, or hydroelectric available. So uh, lots of challenges to, uh, to navigate and, and to advise these clients on, on, on how to best deal with that. Because energy yeah. transition is really a, an umbrella term, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, uh, uh, it's one of the first things I, I try to do with my clients is try and define like what is the, the actual problem we're trying to solve or, or what is the actual opportunity we're trying to create out of, out of this energy transition. Um, do you maybe want to take a guess at, uh, at defining that? <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, energy transition... The, the reason why it's there, of course, a lot of people have seen the impact of the climate change. Um, in the book Operating with Positive Impact, there is a really nice example about June 2022, uh, where yeah, more than 10 extreme events only from that month across the globe have been listed, going from um, tropical storms to... Uh, extreme high temperatures, but also extreme uh, water um, falls in in China, for example. Um, so yeah, it's 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 been a crazy month, uh, June 2022. Another example that you see in the book is the, uh, where they just list all the temperatures month by month from the pre-industrial industrialization time until now where there is yeah a clear increase of the of the temperature uh, year by year and um so one of the the yeah th one of the reasons the energy transition is needed is because of the uh in yeah industrialization leading to the soaring carbon dioxide emission rates because there is a clear uh, correlation between the carbon dioxide emission rates and the global temperature. And of course, there is a Paris Agreement that a lot of you might know where um, it has been, yeah, w where the goal was to keep global temperature at 1.5 degrees above pre industrial rates. Um, the problem is, we're probably not going to reach that because if you look at how we are decreasing we are currently reducing our carbon intensity with 1.4 percent per year and for example 2021 was only 0.5 percent per year um, and we actually would need 15.2 percent a year reduction to reach the paris agreement 1.5 uh, 1 degrees above pre-industrial levels so it might uh, probably um it's all uh, yeah the, the two degrees um, yeah, increase of uh, warming is more realistic and that's currently mm. being yeah, being assumed as being a more realistic uh, number. So basically we would need anyway, in case of the two degrees uh, warming increase, we would still need a uh, five times faster decarbonization rate uh, compared to what we're doing right now. That's that's huge, Ian. I, that's I mean, huge. when we talk about we need to go five times faster than we are going at, at today, can you make that a little bit more concrete, those rates at which we are decarbonizing now and what we should be decarbonizing at? Yeah, so 1.4% a year at this point, and we should go to 6.3% a year as of, yeah, I think 2021 or 2022, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, those th those are big numbers, and um, it 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 highlights what kind of a big, massive effort is still needed uh, in uh, in this area. Um, and we talk a lot about you know transitioning to 
a low carbon economy. We talk a lot about uh, uh, lowering uh, our, uh, our CO2 footprint. Um, for me, before we go into some of the technologies that help us in this transition, what's important here to note is also, um, I don't like the word decarbonization because um, I think that hydrocarbons will continue to play a massively important role in, uh, our, uh, in our society. Um, but what I do agree on is that they will become far too valuable just to burn. So with the limited amount of feedstocks that we have in the world, we're going to need uh, those, uh, those hydrocarbons available to turn them into some high-performance plastics, some lightweighting materials, in order to further support this energy transition and build on all of the technologies that uh, we're going to talk about in, in a few moments. So I prefer to talk about the, the transition to a, a low-carbon economy. Mm. Makes sense, yes, indeed. Um, maybe one of, the, one of the first ones to talk about, Jan, is uh, CCUS. So um, CCUS, together with the um, renewable, uh, renewables uh, forms, I would say, the two big uh, pathways towards that transition. Um, and with CCUS, you mean carbon capture, utilization, and storage? Right? Correct, yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Um, and CCUS is often seen as an, uh, a very necessary intermediate step, but I think part of it can become part of the long-term solution as well. Um, CCUS, or Carbon Capture, Utilization and Storage, um, it's about, first of all, capturing the carbon when um, you actually uh, burn it uh, in, uh, in various applications like power plants, industrial facilities, but also the part where um, you um, define and, and design and implement installations that actually capture the carbon that is already in the atmosphere. Because, you know, what, what, what is in there is not just going out of there. Eh? It's kind of a closed mm -hmm. system, uh, the world, no, well, not entire, but it's pretty close system. Um, so it takes, uh, it takes quite a while for, uh, for that to, to dissolve. So uh, part of the solution is actively reducing uh, the carbon from uh, the atmosphere. So that we do in, in carbon capture. Utilization then is the process of doing something useful with that carbon. Eh? One of the easiest uh, applications that we think about is putting them in fizzy drinks. Uh, mm. um, but uh, there's, uh, there's lots of others too. Um, you can use them uh, in a lot of building materials, mm. uh, in production processes for those materials, uh, in all sorts of plastics, but also synthetic fuels. Um, and then the last piece, the, the last S uh, in uh, CCUS is uh, for storage. And that's um, when uh, uh, there is no uh, viable alternative to actually utilizing that uh, carbon. Um, it's still better to store it somewhere underground in uh, a place that's been depleted, for example, uh, abandoned uh, drilling rock formations mm -hmm. where previously uh, there had been operations for uh, exploring oil and gas, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then a second point that you mentioned were the renewable energy sources. Um, maybe it's good to, to go a bit more in detail about all energy sources that we currently know. Um, so, yeah, of course, we all know the fossil fuels, uh, co coal, oil, gas. Uh, those were the ones that were... Um, yeah, that, that are responsible mainly for the uh, carbon emissions that we currently have, especially coal and oil are very, very polluting. Um, then there is, of course, nuclear power. Um, nucle nuclear power is widely used. It is very low in carbon, um, but there are some challenges related to, for example, waste management. There are also safety concerns with it. Um, and there is, of course, the public perception related to uh, disasters. Um, and then you have the more well-known and uh, yeah, green energy sources, um, solar, wind, hydroelectric. Um, the thing with solar and wind, of, of course, is they, they both have no uh, emissions, but they are depending very on the weather conditions, so they can be very vi variable. Um, and then you have also the hydroelectric part. Um, 
there also are no uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But on the other hand, um, yeah, it's also um, depending on the the location. So, for example, in Norway, you have quite some uh, hydroelectric instra- installations because you you're very uh, you have a lot of mountains there. Um, on the other hand, while building, for example, a dam, you might also have an impact on the environment there. So it, it, there's also some yeah downsides of it. Um, Philip, do you have anything to add before moving to the less known energy sources? Um, yeah, a c- couple of points, maybe. Um, so um, exactly the, the fossil fuels are, I would say, the ones that powered the industrial revolution and that created sort of a lot of wealth uh, in the world uh, for, uh, uh, for, for our society. Um, what we sometimes forget is the kind of historical debt uh, that uh, is owed to development countries where um, sometimes, you know, the, 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 the moral standpoint is taken, like, you know, those countries, they should be able to go through the same curve as the Western world went through uh, at some point in time. And this is dangerous. I think this is incredibly dangerous. If you look at developing countries and the carbon intensity of those economies, um, it's something where one... Um, it's just a really bad point in the in time in the world to be on that curve of you know investing heavily in uh, in, in 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 those energy sources but secondly those countries also have an opportunity to sort of leapfrog and avoid all of the mistakes that the West has uh, has made uh, in terms of uh, creating a very carbon dependent economy um, so I think it provides challenges but also a lot of opportunities for those countries and then, Um, A little bit similarly regarding nuclear power, nuclear is a very stable source of energy, right? Um, And it's easy to dismiss uh, it as a a, a non-green source of energy because indeed there's a challenge with waste waste management. Indeed, there have been incidents uh, globally um, uh, and and perception of it is generally not so good. But we do see like lots of hopeful... Um, progress in uh, the area of nuclear as well, where we're now reconsidering walk-away safe reactors, um, where um, uh, some countries are heavily betting and parts of the industry are quite heavily betting on small modular reactors, where, for example, a couple of chemicals companies are uh, doing pilot projects with a small modular reactor on site that is walk-away safe and that besides energy is generating a lot of steam which is then directly used as a side effect of the reaction in uh, some of their chemical processes. Okay, and what do you mean with walk-away safe reactors? I don't know the concept. So they're they're sort of um, designed to uh, not go into a meltdown uh, at the moment where um, the reaction cannot be stopped or cooled anymore. Uh, So in the event of a natural disaster or something like that, you could just walk away from them and be sure that the reaction does not run away. Technically, how they do it is like in big basins uh, with salt and thorium uh, instead of uranium, etc. Yeah, maybe something for a follow-up episode. uh, Yeah, it sounds very interesting. I didn't know about it. So, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And that maybe brings us to some of the lesser-known renewable energy sources, because to be clear, we don't consider nuclear to be a renewable energy. You still have waste to manage. Uh, Just a a, a low or or near-zero carbon technology. Um, We have geothermal energy, for example. So that's uh, uh, heat from the Earth's crust, uh, right, Jan? Yeah, from the side, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty constant, pretty reliable. um, But you kind of need to be in the right place in the world for it to be um, very useful to you. Um, We often combine it with heat pumps, so it kind of um, is is used as a a, a way to to give the heat pump a bit of an advantage over Mm -hmm. uh, a normal uh, normal heat pump that uses the air uh, as a starting point. Uh, We use a a slightly warmer part of the earth uh, to do it. Um, and then biomass. Biomass is where we use organic material um, to uh, to burn it, and that releases carbon. But the idea, the whole idea behind it, is that the carbon that's uh, uh, released in, uh, in 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 the reaction in, in the burning is offset by the carbon 
that the plants have actually absorbed over their lifetime during the growth. Um, now that does lead to some other challenges like deforestation. Um, you need to be careful that you manage the supply chain uh, quite well. Uh, so think about uh, pellets. At some point there was a, a, a small scandal around uh, pellets for uh, residential heating that were all sort of sourced out of Poland, uh, b brought here on big trucks. Uh, uh, obviously not being a very uh, overall uh, emissions neutral product. Yeah. Um, and then the last one, and this is I think one of the more promising ones, but also one of the more challenging ones, is hydrogen. Yeah. So hydrogen itself is an energy carrier or a vector, as we sometimes talk about it. It's not really a direct source of energy. So it means that um, we need to burn it uh, in order to um, get the, uh, the energy out of it. Uh, but when we burn it, it burns clean. So it does not release carbon. It just releases uh, water vapor, actually, uh, uh, into, uh, into the atmosphere. Um, the tricky part of hydrogen is it's not readily available in the world in, its, uh, uh, in, in, in a form that's pure enough to burn it. So depending on the way that we make the hydrogen, there's a whole gamut of colors. Um, there's a gamut that starts with, uh, and I'll, I'll sort of try and take this from very high carbon fit footprint all the way to low carbon footprint, but there's a rainbow of colors. There's black hydrogen, brown hydrogen, both of them uh, produced by coal um, and a, in a process called steam methane reforming. A uh, gray hydrogen does that as well uh, with natural gas. And then when you apply um, CCUS, remember, uh, carbon capture, utilization, and, and storage, uh, when you apply that to a steam methane reforming process, then you actually have blue hydrogen, which has a, a, a low or can even be a near zero carbon footprint. Um, and then we come to the more greener renewable sources of, of hydrogen, where through electrolysis, um, which is a chemical reaction, where you actually split water into hydrogen um, molecules and uh, an oxygen molecule. Um, you have, depending on the electricity source to power that chemical reaction, you have pink hydrogen if it's powered by nuclear, you have uh, a green hydrogen if it's powered by uh, renewables. And all of those we, we consider to be very, very low carbon footprint uh, mm -hmm. uh, technologies. And are they all mature already or is there... Yeah, I, th I think there are quite some challenges with hydrogen, right? So steam methane reforming is a very mature process. And remember, uh, that's where we use... Um, actually, uh, we use methane a uh, big part of natural gas uh, as, a, as a base molecule, eh? C, uh, CH4, uh, so lots of H's in there uh, that we can, uh, we can try to break down into hydrogen, H2. Um, it's a series of chemical reactions. It's, it's, it's well known. Um, it just takes quite a bit of, of, of energy to uh, make that work. Um, but it's relatively mature technology and combined with CCUS, to deliver blue hydrogen, it's, it's, it's very mature. Um, electrolysis is a bit less uh, mature on the technology curve. It's an older uh, technology that we know quite well, but the yields of, electro of electrolysis are not where we want them to be in order to uh, adopt this on industrial scales and make it cost competitive. And that brings us to like the biggest challenge today of uh, uh, green hydrogen uh, uh, or pink hydrogen for that matter is the cost competitiveness because um, yeah you know you 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 not only have to produce the hydrogen but you also have to transport it um, and then you need to convert sort of your processes that uh, use the hydrogen as a fuel. Uh, to make sure that they can, uh, th th that burners, turbines, etc., work on this new energy carrier uh, as opposed to methane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, transportation, how would that work then? Because uh, can, can we, for example, re reuse uh, gas pipes for it? Or th is, it, is there other ways of transportation needed? Yeah. So, um, 
there are th there are lots of positive experiments where they're actually introducing um, hydrogen, pure hydrogen, into the current uh, uh, natural gas transport network at high pressure. Um, that uh, th those things are, are hopeful. The molecules uh, you have to know a hydrogen molecule is is is, is an order of magnitude smaller than uh, a methane or an ethane molecule, natural gas uh, components. Um, so um, you, you, you need to repurpose part of the network if you want in the future to have a pure flow of hydrogen going through it. Um, you gotta make sure you, 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 that, that everything is like really well isolated mm -hmm. and there are no, no leaks because those, th those molecules are fundamentally so much smaller. So that's indeed an infrastructure challenge. Um, for countries, I do see a an interesting uh, um, uh, role for the government there. Yeah. Actually, eh? um, so Belgium, uh, as you might know, has has made it a priority to uh, uh, to encourage investment in hydrogen, to really lead the European way uh, on uh, the uptake and the creation of a hydrogen market. Um, so. There's legislation uh, on the table that's actively pushing, you know, the the transport uh, operators in Belgium to actually um, uh, think about these questions and uh, uh, invest in infrastructure. Okay, very interesting. Maybe maybe it's time to go a bit to the economic imp implications of uh, the energy <laughs> transition. Eh? I mean, uh, do we, for example, know what uh, what? energy source will be most likely used in 10 years, in 20 years, 30 years, years? Because, I mean, it all depends on the on the adoption rates of each of these technologies. For example, what you mentioned on hydrogen, yeah, depending on the government, one government that pushes it, not a government that doesn't push it, I can imagine that there is a huge difference in, adop difference in adoption rate. Yeah, absolutely. You, you gave... You gave the, the the right consulting answer, Jan, and it is it depends. Um, <laughs> but we, we've actually done a couple of uh, mar market analyses for some of our clients yeah. um, that are asking the same questions. And they, for example, are looking at uh, big capex investments on assets that will have to run for 20 years, 30 years into the future, and they don't want to make a mistake. Uh, with regards to which energy source that will run on. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so the answer to your question is, I would say, driven by two things. On the one hand, there's supply. On the other hand, there's demand. And we see a lot of uh, progress being made, although it may not always appear like that. But if you look at it over a longer period of time, a lot of progress is being made in uh, the Conference of Parties. Uh, that uh, that happens every year, where governments, you know, agree on let us let us tackle goals collectively and individually as a country on what the energy mix should look like in our country in order to reach the targets of the Paris Agreement. Uh. Um, but I also see more and more on the demand side, uh, hopeful things happening with. Uh, companies that are starting to realize, hey, we can actually benefit from this transition as well. It's not just a challenge to, you know, uh, look at it as a massive investment wave. It's exactly that. It's, in the, it's a way to invest in mm -hmm. uh, a, an economically viable alternative that will um, help us thrive over the next decades as an organization. Yeah. Yeah. Never waste a good crisis, right? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> no, uh, good, yeah. And, and operationally, I think, yeah, that means um, for companies probably that they want to reduce their energy consumption within their operations or uh, sometimes also adopt their, or yeah, deal with variability in, in a specific matter that they, that they uh, respond to the, to the, yeah, to the amount of energy that is available at a certain point in time. Um, maybe on the energy uh, consumption reduction, I think there's there's a lot of uh, potential there and a lot of companies just by visualizing what you're doing, by by showing, um, uh, by putting some analysis on it, uh, by by benchmarking machines versus other machines. Yeah, you, you can do quite a lot of things with low effort, low... Um, low investments. Um, and then I guess, Jan, it's also about using that data to steer 
the operator's behavior. So it actually yeah, makes yeah, an impact, right? Yeah, definitely. It's uh, um, any oper uh, ideally any oper operator should know exactly what the result of his actions are. So they should know whether their actions have an impact on uh, have a positive or negative impact on the energy consumption, and it, they should know it immediately. So live uh, live data. Um, yeah, then there's of course the dealing with the variability in supply of the renewable energy, for example, solar wind, which is I, at least in Belgium already widely adopted, mm -hmm. or uh, at least it starts to be widely adopted. But what we also hear at companies is that they don't really know how to deal with the variability in the supply. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Also there, there's um, a lot of progress being made in sort of the last two, three years um, with like industrial scale battery arrays appearing. Uh, so battery electric storage systems mm -hmm. that are um, being used to buffer um, not only the uh, the, the own production of uh, the, the organizations that are installing them, because obviously they have started by putting windmills on their site, by putting uh, solar panels on all of their uh, plants and warehouses. Um, so to make sure that they can actually benefit from that investment over more hours, also when the sun does not shine uh, or the wind does not blow, uh, to have that uh, uh, energy available to them. But then secondly, um, also to um, work with grid operators where those parts are actually considered to be reserve capacity to be released back on the network whenever there is a need. And if you size your installation correctly, there is actually a case to be made for uh, companies to invest in that and be compensated partly for that investment by the grid operator because they help ensure stability of the grid mm. where the increase of renewables is uh, is getting bigger and bigger. So a lot of opportunities there. Absolutely. Um, okay, so okay, we, we have talked about a few operational uh, things. Of course, every company has their strategy or is starting to, get to have their strategy about how to become more net zero or energy neutral or um, yeah, whatever you want to call it. Um, now, I think a lot of companies are struggling with yeah, some of the, the following questions. So how, how, for example, do they know they're doing the right things, uh, that they're actually focusing on the, the, the topics that bring the most value? Or how do they know they're doing enough? They're act with, all of, with, all, with everything that they're doing, that they're going to reach their, uh, their targets? And how do they then actually link their achievements back to, to the global KPIs? I think that's that's a big challenge for companies in general. Eh? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's not a a, a large or a, an energy intensive uh, company in the world that has not made a pledge. Uh, I think mm -hmm. um, we've seen pledges left, right, and center. The one um, a bit crazier than the other, but they're all quite ambitious. I think a lot of um, uh, companies are now starting to realize well solving the energy sourcing part is, is, is only a part of, uh, of that energy transition and of making that pledge reality. And we see mm -hmm. the increased uh, uh, pressure on scope three emissions. We see uh, lots of, of, of regulation coming our way on, on, on that front as well. So having a way to measure and steer the extent with which your portfolio of projects is actually contributing to, on the one hand, your legal requirements, but on the other hand, your pledges as well that you have made towards your investors, towards society, towards your customers, towards your suppliers, is becoming more and more uh, of a, a challenge and an opportunity because knowing you're doing the right things is one thing. Knowing you're doing it fast enough and in the right way is, uh, is the other part of the equation. Yeah, yeah definitely. Good. So any final thoughts? key takeaways you want to share, Philippe? Um, maybe one final message, and I'd say the, the, the future outlook is bright. As, a, as a, um, industrialists, we have a, a, a moral obligation to be optimistic about the future. Um, it's easy to look at industry as one of the bigger culprits of uh, 
uh, the, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and global warming, etc. But I do think that if industrials, science, um, and uh, business professionals can work together and sort of use all the ingredients that we discussed here today in the right mix, we can really make a difference together. And I'm, I'm quite uh, uh, hopeful and optimistic that uh, we'll be able to succeed. Okay, thank you. It's a very positive message to end uh, the, this episode today. Um, and of course, to all our listeners, thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, there will probably be another episode soon. Um, also, feel free to contact us if you'd like to have a deep dive conversation on one of the areas that we, that we covered today. So uh, it will be my pleasure. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. What I will remember from this episode, and Jan and Philippe explained it very well, is that reaching the Paris Agreement will require a massive effort, which makes energy transition essential and urgent. The two pathways towards energy transitions are CCUS and renewables, like solar, wind, water, geothermal energy or hydrogen. But one of the challenges organizations are facing is to decide in which energy sources they should invest. Like Philippe explained, it requires a broad understanding of how the global supply and demand of each energy source is going to evolve. I share Philippe's optimism of a bright future ahead of us. I actually already see many industrial scientists and business professionals working together to go through this energy transition and broader sustainable transition. So let's continue to connect and share as it is the only path to transform a business world into the right direction. In our next episode, we will continue sharing, and this time, it is going to be about the world of circular economy and sustainable value chains. See you in the next one.